I thought I, we could start out by talking about short stories, um, which uh, both of you guys sort of made your name initially with, with short stories. Um, and that's something that a lot of young writers do. They, they write a book of short stories and then they move on to a novel because often because as you may know, uh, short stories um, are a hard way to make a living these days. Um, and so m many people just, they move on to the novel and then they never look back. Um, but both of you guys have, have come back to stories repeatedly. And in fact, after publishing novels, you've come back and, and published uh, collections of short stories as your third book. Um, and I wanted to ask you guys um, a little bit about what the impulse is there and, and why you continually return to short stories and, and, and what that form has offered you guys in, in your writing lives. And I thought we'd start with Juno. Uh, the plan was never to go back to short stories. It just took a lot longer for, to finish my third book than I thought. It took like 16 years. It was supposed to be <laughs> finished a lot sooner. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of like mail. One postcard starts out and early and then comes late. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, the reason I, I, I hope to God never have to write another short story is because <laughs> even though I absolutely adore the form, I've, I've always held this sort of um, kind of operational sense of, you know, especially coming out of the traditions I come out of, Spanish and English, is that the, you know, the, the short story form is, is inc for me, it's incredibly challenging, um, especially as a tradition, as a convention. Um, it's, it's one of those forms that requires really utterly like you've got to be a gem cutter in a way. I mean, sure, you don't have to be, but I guess I've always liked what I've enjoyed about stories is that the amount of work it takes to have them structurally, you know, work out and yet to seem in some ways naturalistic. I just, it's an enormous amount of work and the slightest bit of defect shows in a short story the way it doesn't show in a novel. I always say to myself and, you know, I, I, when I talk about these things, I think about that the, the, the promise and the, the danger of the short story is that it can be perfect the promise and the danger of the novel is that it can never be perfect. I didn't discover them really until college. And I think uh, what was exciting to me about them is I had just the promiscuity of um, creativity that's possible. I think it's true, right? Like as an economic calculation, a short story is never going to work out because it will take you months or years to do one and then you'll get paid in like seven hoagie sandwiches. Yeah. So it's, I think it's difficult to really tie that kind of labor to the short story. And, and just knowing that, um, that it's, it's not, it's never, it's, it's like love, right? You, it's irrational. It's irrational to want to devote that much of yourself to, to the thing. Um, and the novel, I don't know, man. That was, I thought about you because I think Juno and I had the same trajectory where a short story like expanded and was going to become the novel. And um, I just, it's true, you lose sight of the land for a long time. Um, and it, I think there is a consolation in thinking this is going to be flawed because I made an edit and it changed seven other resonances in the novel that I even know about because it's 300 pages at this point, right? It's tough to sustain that world yeah. for that length of time. Um, yeah. The story too, it's right, it's, it's that sort of um, utopian dream that you're going to order language on the page. It's micro enough that you can get it, um, make, make a perfect short story, which it's a little like why those people keep trying to summit Everest, even though it's, um, you know, bones all the way up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and do you guys know when you're setting out on something, whether it's a novel or a short story? George Saunders always says that, who has never written a novel, always says that he always starts out intending, thinking he has an idea for a novel. And then he writes, he writes hundreds of pages, yeah. and then he realizes it's a short story. Do you guys identify with that? Or? Willing, that's never happened. <laughs> Generating many, many pages that never add up to a story, that's crazy. Um, 
Yeah, that's my exact problem. I have. I don't know if what your desktop looks like. Mine is called like <laughs> Karen fails. <laughs> like <laughs> mine is called like the month of April. <laughs> like a disaster. You know, I've heard people say that like writer books speak to other books. You ever heard that? Which is it's as far away from my concept. I'm interested in readers. I'm not interested in writing books for other books. My relationship is strictly to readers. And so, sure, books speak to each other. Of course, one is referencing books and you're like referring to Moby Dick or referring to Beloved. But still, for me, I really love the idea that my reader would collaborate with me. So that my first and my third book, I wanted to create enough material in both books for my reader to make even the most simple generic designation, which is, is this a fucking novel or is this a Schillich story collection? And in both of those books, there's enough material to support either one's case. Yeah, like they call Joy Luck Club a novel, guys. You guys read Joy Luck Club? Yeah. Love that book, whatever, whatever. Politics complicated, but come on, a novel? Yeah, it is. And so I just kind of love this idea that the reader would make decisions not only of the, the book, what the book is, but also that the, the reader would collaborate in structuring how the book comes together. But now I've decided, tell me how this sounds, I say that I've sacrificed one kind of uh, realism for emotional realism. Because people are always saying, well, a nine-year-old might not have access, for example, to metaphor or to, you know, even to structuring a narrative in that kind of coherent way. Um, and I just feel like sometimes I'll give myself access to language that is beyond what you could realistically expect of a 12-year-old. Because I don't know, if I wrote a story in the voice of a 12-year-old, wouldn't I don't know, guys. I just think um, it would be pretty boring. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess for me, the balance is just trying to stay true to the, the innocence of that state, right? So like, like I'll have a lot of like hyper-articulate verbal kids who are basically dorks and have no perspective whatsoever. It's close to where I'm at today. Um, <laughs> it's close to where I'm at today, but more so, you know? And. Um, and give them access to language, but they, I would blunt their perspective so they feel credibly, you know, 11 or 12. I mean, sure. I mean, look, it's part of it comes from what do we want from, you know, like what do you guys want from your narratives? I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly looking to, when I read stories, I'm looking for lots of things, right? But one of them is certainly a space of deliberation to understand the world. Yeah, I mean, that's what stories are really useful for. They open up a space. You think about the world in a better or an interesting way, and you think about what it means to be human in it. And I guess I, very early on, was aware that all of the conversations that my internal self was trying to have with the society were not happening in what I would call realism. In other words, like, realism does a really bad job of talking about the shit that an immigrant kid of African descent living in the United States, arriving a few months before the fall of Saigon, living through Ronald Reagan in the 80s and the constant, persistent nuclear terror of that period. You know, just there was stuff that I really needed. I needed like confirmation that I wasn't insane. And I think books, it's, it is exactly that. It's a portal. I mean, there's like sort of the practical, you want to have an exit strategy maybe if you're 13 or 14 and your life is hell and you just want to have like a door you can carry around. So yeah. there's, there's that. But I think I was really drawn. I was so excited to read Oscar. Wow, I was like, I had a big crush on, um, on Oscar. Because we have the same reading history. It was exciting to discover that. If um, only he had known. If only he'd known, man. That book would have been so short. It would, people would be pissed at me. They'd be like, don't give it up then. It's bad, bad news for your, your narrative strategy. Um, but uh, Dune, right? So Dune was a place where I felt that, you know, it, we were talking about kids having antenna out for every kind of injustice and, um, and that there is no vocabulary for a long time. You're just not hearing any echo of your own intuitions about, you know, violence. The, I, I mean, I, I loved horror for that reason, too. I loved Stephen King. And if, if by love you mean read obsessively and like went to sixth grade with like a haunted war rattled face because I hadn't slept. Um, <laughs> I don't know if love is adequate to whatever that was. Um, I did so bad in math. Um, it's his fault. 